Have you ever sat through planning meetings on construction projects and had no idea what people were talking about? Maybe they were using complicated terms like critical path, float and lag. Have you ever wondered how a project schedule actually works out the overall project duration? Or maybe you just find the whole topic of project scheduling overwhelming and confusing. Well, if you've answered yes to any of these questions, then this course is designed just for you. My name's Tim, and I'm an engineer with lots of experience on the design and construction of major infrastructure projects. I've been building short courses to teach the fundamental construction management skills to engineers and other construction management professionals. The courses are designed to teach the skills that you'll use on your job every day. And so far, we've had over a thousand students enroll in our course. Each course is loaded with hours of content and practice activities to make sure you're equipped with the skills you need to excel at your job. This short video is an extract of our course on construction project scheduling, where we'll teach you everything you need to know about optimizing and analyzing a construction project schedule. We go through critical path analysis, forward and backward passes, schedule constraints, and the different treatments that can be applied. If you find this video interesting and useful, check out the link in the below description to our complete Udemy course on construction project scheduling. Hi, and welcome to section 2.5, optimizing and analyzing the schedule. So far, we've built this schedule model that captures all the work we have to do, when we need to do it, and the order it needs to be done in. We've been able to present this and capture it in the schedule model. Now we need to analyze and optimize the model. We need to understand the critical path, the risk in the schedule, and need to make sure we're not going to violate any constraints. In some instances, we'll need to apply treatments and alter our delivery methodology to achieve the project time requirements. The critical path is the series of activities that if delayed, delay project completion. When we analyze and optimize the schedule, these are the activities that we will be play, paying particular attention to and most likely look to alter and change the delivery methodology to optimize the schedule. Activities that don't fall on the critical path will still have some potential to fall on the critical path and risk delaying the project. Maybe even something as simple as landscaping on a building project that can be started early and doesn't take very long could delay project completion of the entire project if it's not started on. The potential for an activity to fall on the critical path is referred to as its float. Float, usually calculated in days, is the number of activities an activity can be delayed before it falls on the critical path. When we do a critical path analysis of the schedule, we'll calculate the activity's early start and early finish. This is based on all the predecessor activities completed as early as possible. The earliest start date of an activity could begin and based on its duration, finish. The late start is the opposite of the early start. It's based on the latest an activity could begin before it falls on the project critical path. We'll also look at float. Total float, often referred to as float, is the amount of time an activity can be delayed without delaying the overall project completion, i.e. the amount of time an activity can be delayed before it falls on the project critical path. Free float is the amount of time an activity can be delayed without delaying the early start of a successor activity, even if it doesn't fall on the project critical path. So free float will always be shorter in duration than total float. Activities on the project critical path will have a total float of zero. Therefore, a delay to one of these activities delays the project completion. We can calculate float using a forward and backward pass of the network schedule. So let's go through a basic example of how to do the forward and backward pass. The street lighting example used previously is a little bit too simple to do this on. 
so a lot of the detail would be missed. We'll go through first a forward pass to calculate the early start and early finish for each activity, and then a backward pass to calculate the late start and late finish. Float can then be calculated based on the difference between early start and early finish. This will allow us to identify the project critical path. So let's look at a slightly more complicated network schedule with seven different activities. Linked showing predecessor relationships, all finished to start, and lags between activity three and activity six, and activity five and activity seven. Starting with the forward path, forward pass, we start at activity one. As it is the first activity, the early start date for activity one is zero and the early finish date is the early start plus the activity duration, which is four days. So the early finish is day four. For activity two, the early start is the early finish of its predecessor, activity one. The duration is six days, so the early finish is day 10. Going through, we, cal we can calculate this for all the subsequent activities using the same approach. The early start of an activity is the early finish of the predecessor. Where we have lags between activities, the early start of an activity will be the early finish of the predecessor activity plus the lag. So for activity six, the early start is the early finish of activity three plus the two day lag. Where activities have multiple predecessors, as in the case for activity seven, the early start of activity seven will be the latest early finish of its predecessor plus any lag. So the early finish for activity four is day 11. Activity five is day 16 plus a five day lag, which makes it day 21. And activity six is day 17. Therefore the early start of activity seven is day 21. This completes the forward pass. And we've now calculated the early start and early finish for each activity. This means we know the earliest any activity could start and finish when there are no delays to any preceding activities. It's now time to go through and complete the backward pass to calculate the late start and late finish for each activity. These are the latest any activity could start and finish before it delays the project. So, for the last activity, the late start and late finish of activity seven will be the same as the, early, as the early start and early finish, as it's the last activity. If it finishes later than the early finish, it will be delaying the project. The late finish of preceding activities is the late start of succeeding activities. So for activity six, the late finish is day 21, which is the late start of activity seven. Any lags will cause the late finish of the activity to shift forward. So for activity five, the latest that activity can finish before it delays activity seven will be day 16, as there is a five day lag between them. If it finishes later than that, it will pre prevent activity seven from starting on its late start day, day 21. When multiple successes exist, the late finish date will be the earliest late start of its successor. So for activity two, so since activity Activity 5 needs to start on day 10. Before it begins to delay the project, activity 2 will need to finish by day 10 to prevent delaying the project. We can then complete these calculations for the entire network schedule. And for each activity, we'll know the early start, early finish, late start, and late finish. From this, we can then calculate total float. This is the amount of time an activity can be delayed before it begins delaying the overall project. Float is calculated by the late start minus the early start. So for example, activity three has a float of four days because the early start is day four and the late start is day eight. So activity three could be delayed by four days before it begins to impact the overall project schedule. The project critical path is then all the activities that have zero total float. These are the activities that if delayed 
would delay project completion. So if activity one takes five days to complete rather than four days, the project completion date will no longer be day 25, but day 26. The activities highlighted in red are the critical path. That is activity one, two, five, and seven. So what have we actually worked out from this analysis? Well, we know this project will take 25 days to complete. We know that activities one, two, five, and seven are the critical path, and that if these activities are delayed, then the project duration will be longer than 25 days. And we also know for the other activities, how much contingency, i.e. float, we have. After our forward and backward pass, we have a really good understanding of our project schedule, the duration and the critical path. We now need to review any constraints in the project schedule and check that we don't violate them. Constraints are limitations and risks that need to be considered when reviewing our project schedule. Examples of constraints might be milestones we need to meet, such as a certain finish date. In our previous example, if we needed to finish the work covered by that schedule in 19 days, then this is a constraint we would have violated. Milestones might be both internal, i.e. driven by the project, or external, driven by the client. There are resourcing constraints, so we might exceed the resources available in the way we've scheduled the works. Two activities might not be able to be scheduled in the same time since we won't have the resources to complete them in parallel. We might violate site access constraints. For example, we, not, we might not be able to do two activities at once because there isn't the space available on site. Or the schedule may violate budget constraints. If our work takes too long to complete, we may exceed the project budget on overhead costs and need to shorten the project duration. Alternatively, the scheduled duration may be increased to save money on resources. These constraints need to be identified and assessed. On a major project, identifying every constraint and resourcing issue can be complicated and challenging and beyond the scope of this course, but understanding the types of constraints and how to identify them is still an important step. When a constraint is violated, for example, the project duration is anticipated to take longer than what is contractually required, we need to put in place a treatment for that constraint. Treatments are scheduling techniques used to shorten or accelerate the entire project duration without affecting the overall work done, i.e. the scope. These techniques will change the delivery methodology and the delivery solution. Two of the most common treatments used are crashing and fast tracking. Fast tracking is the process of changing the start to finish relationship between activities to shorten the project duration. Under normal circumstances, if activity two requires activity one to be completed before activity two can begin, using fast track and tracking, we will start activity two before activity one is fully complete. A classic example of fast tracking would be the relationship between design and construction. Under ideal circumstances, design would finish before construction begins. However, to reduce the project schedule, what typically happens is construction will begin before design has fully finished to reduce the time frame of the project. Another example might be testing and commissioning begins before a system is fully constructed. Fast tracking typically increases risks. For the design example, if you start building off a non-IFC design, any design changes will incur significant construction costs. Crashing is different to fast tracking. During crashing, you still wait for activity one to finish before activity two begins. However, you increase the amount of resources to reduce the time taken to complete the activities. For example, to construct the trench faster, you might use six work crews instead of three to reduce the amount of time taken. Crashing typically increases cost as you need more resources that require more supervision and will likely not work as efficiently and effectively as less resources. So basically, this gives us a little bit of an overview of how to identify the project critical path. Analyze the schedule, 
and confirm constraints haven't been violated and explore some options to shorten project duration if required. In the next and final section of developing the project schedule, we'll briefly go through the importance and process of making sure all stakeholders agree on the project schedule.